Welcome, friends. This uh, United Lodge of Theosophists serves the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. This and other ULT groups throughout the world are dedicated to preserving and promulgating the eternal message of the Masters of Wisdom. This message is available for us to make our own as we test it against our own inner reality. All are welcome to participate with us here at 4865 A. Cordell Avenue, Suite 230, Bethesda, Maryland, every Sunday at 11 a.m. to discuss a particular topic. And every uh, first and third Sunday at 12.30 p.m., there uh, is a uh, roundtable discussion. We are currently reading and discussing The Ocean of Theosophy by William T. Judge. Being sustained by students to the degree they commit themselves only uh, in terms of contributing resources and efforts, there are no admission charges. The only tie that binds us is similarity of aim, purpose, and teaching. Theosophia, also known as God Wisdom, or Wisdom of the Ages, or the Science of the Soul, ever is and does not change. The message of Theosophy is embedded in the laws of nature is brought out from time to time as conditions permit and goes underground at other times or becomes tainted due to the personalities seeking a following or selfishness like we find in this age of materialism. Robert Crosby established the United Lodge of Theosophists in 1909 to revive the message in its pure form as pre presented uh, by H.P. Blavatsky, also known as the Messenger of the Masters, and William Q. Judge, her counterpart. The ULT is guided by its declaration of only a few paragraphs which is printed on the back of our program. So in, its, in essence, uh, the, the program talks about uh, the practice of the principles of theosophy through a true realization of the self and a profound conviction of universal brotherhood. This, as we all know, is a lofty undertaking and does not leave the time or inclination to take part in side issues as we focus on internalizing the truth which ever is. All are encouraged to make this divine wisdom a living power within themselves by assimilating the message and progressing by self-induced and self-devised methods of helping and teaching others. Our reading today is from the Voice of the Silence, starting on page 26. The paths are two, the great perfections three. Six are the virtues that transform the body into the tree of knowledge. Who shall approach them? Who shall fi first enter them? Who shall first hear the doctrine of two paths in one? The truth unveiled about the secret heart. The law which shunning learning teaches wisdom reveals a tale of woe. Alas, alas, that all men should possess a liar, be one with the great soul, and that possessing it, a liar should so little avail them. Behold how <coughs> the moon reflected in the tranquil waves, a liar is reflected by the small and by the great, is mirrored in the tiniest atoms, yet fails to reach the heart of all. Alas, 
that so few men should profit by the gift, the priceless boon of learning truth, the right perception of existing things, the knowledge of the non-existent. Saith the pupil, O teacher, what shall I do to reach to wisdom? O wise one, what to gain perfection? Search the two paths, but O land, O be of clean heart before thou startest on thy journey. Before thou takest thy first step, learn to discern the real from the false, the ever fleeting from the everlasting. Learn above all to separate the head learning from soul wisdom, the eye from the heart doctrine. Next Sunday's talk is on the two paths. And now for today's talk on Elijah, the great soul. Thank you. Welcome, friends. As you have just heard, Elijah is everywhere, but not all of us avail of it. And we will look at the code as to why. HPV has a tremendous article called The World Soul, and in that she discusses the perception. We This actually comes from the previous uh, talk, where we, were, we had um, talked about the Gandhas and that was perception, form, um, consciousness. Perception is how we perceive our world, <coughs> and this is internal as well as external. In the ancient times, then, all of the <coughs> <coughs> nations of old, the Zoroastrian, the Buddhist, <coughs> the Hindu, All started with an egg. This is the shape <coughs> of an egg, and it actually conceals everything in it. And there's a germ that enables this. Um, even when we look at the uh, mundane egg of, say, a bird, we look at the egg, and it's a shell with. Uh, inside containing all of the nutrients and everything in it that eventually just by uh, applying heat in other words it is self-contained but by applying heat it germinates and becomes a living concrete thing so from nothing we end up with something and HPV considers this to be also the shape of our universe and she calls it Brahma's egg. So our universe is egg shaped and everything that is going to evolve out of it is within that egg. <coughs> so what is it that enables this evolvement of the universe from this egg shaped uh, boundary? First of all, in the Secret Doctrine, on the first page, she explains the circle and the point in it. The circle, without the point, is the universe in pralaya. It ever is. But once that point is put in its center, it means we are in an active period, and it's going to become a universe or universes, if we consider the other apparent... Um, uh, star systems in our universe. So, in the Katoka Panishad, Purusha, the divine spirit already stands before the original matter. So that sentence tells us that this substance, primordial substance, that is in it 
is always there. It has never been created, it always is. But by periods it is active, and by periods it is inactive, in other words, it is at rest. But that sentence where the spirit of life is standing before it, what does that mean? It's going to get fecundated, in other words, a spirit is going to descend into that primordial substance and activate it. That is how life, the resultant of the two, comes about. And she tells us that this is called Maha Atma Brahma, the spirit of life, which is also identical with anima mandi, the universal soul, the egg of darkness. So this is a liar point in other words. <laughs> what is within it is darkness and what comes out of it is light. Just like the sun, which is a window cut into our reality, that light is within that circle, but it is not visible. It always is, but it is not visible. So, it is the point, she says, in the mundane egg, the germ that will become the universe. So that point is the germ. Just like in the ordinary egg, this germ is what is fecundated and it expands. In the theosophical parlance, it's called either radiation or emanation. The point then is the nucleus, it is radiant and it is reflective of the akashic or the ethereal space. This uh, comes into the terminology of the secret doctrine quite a bit. So what does that space have? Since it is both uh, a nucleus, it is radiant, it is also reflective. It has all of the forms in it. It has not been archetypally produced yet, but it contains it. Why? Because the universal mind, even if it is passive, it has all and everything in it that is going to come about from that point. Um, how does that differentiation occur? Well, in the secret doctrine we have Parabrahm, put it here, and we have Mulaprakri too. These are Sanskrit, but it doesn't really have any equivalent in English. This is the spiritual, and this is the primordial substance. This is what this is called. The two then have to get married in order for that intelligent life to come about. This and that. This becomes prakriti through differentiation and transforms to there. And <coughs> so the nucleus, she tells us, is a kernel of mother substance, a kernel of mother substance. It is the heart and matrix of all the living and existing forces in the universe. It is the kernel from which proceed to spread on their cyclic journeys all of the powers. What are the powers? All of the hierarchies that actually build our universe. And what does that do? It gives the propulsion, the movement, and it is called Sohat in the secret doctrine, that propulsion is necessary for that movement to start the atomic, not the atoms of our universe we're talking about, we're talking about the psycho-spiritual atoms, the primordial ones that are going to be gyrated by Sohat, it's going to be given a movement for that man mantra, because in each man mantra, that movement is different. What is that movement? The vibratory rate is different. Each man mantra has a vib has a vibratory. <coughs> vibratory 
actually rate uh, <coughs> then the powers <coughs> set in action the atom in their functional duties this is in other words a, an intelligent universe it is not by chance but it is by design and it is um, intelligent and that focus within which they meet again in their seventh essence every 11 years 11 years is called the sunspot by the scientific world to the sun's um, environment that they observe but this is a universal uh, occurrence so from the nothing we're going to come to something and this is the process that takes place it is extremely metaphysical <laughs> and it is on the first page of the proem where she actually explains it and it requires tremendous repetition to truly understand it so <coughs> we can't be discouraged but this is the process that takes place and in the secret doctrine she explains the Pythagorean decad, the numbers up to 10. Uh, we can look at them as digits in math, for instance. We do our calculations with them. But in this sense, they're also entities because 1 through 9 are self-moving numbers. Self-moving numbers. And we can look at this egg. Okay. and divide it. What does that then become? There is one and zero. She says the 10 is the perfect number because it contains everything in it. So from nothing, zero of sufferers of the ancients, we come to 10. So what does that one rec uh, represent? line. Okay. In the Pythagorean system, um, here it is, the Ednoma 1, 3, 6 plus 4 is 10. So that is contained in it. What is 1? I mean, what is this? What is this? A line. What's three? Triangle. What is four? Cube. In this progression, the universe comes about. And that, that is the Pythagorean Decad, which are self-moving numbers. And she calls them sacred numbers. So, the allegory then here is that the shell breaks into two and it becomes, one half of it is heaven, the meat inside it is the earth and the white becomes the foam which is all of the waters. That's the allegory that represents that process. So the egg gives birth to the four elements within the fifth, the fifth is akasha, all of the rest comes from that. That primordial substance then is the one that gives that impulse to whatever is going to happen in that manvantara. But it is also the essence, the spirit, and the germ that evolves into every form that we see in the universe. So there is that one, and from that one, everything else evolves. And what are the elements? What are the elements of the ancient? Now, we have a chemical elements table uh, from Mendeley. Uh, no, uh, this is the one that is the biology. But anyway, um, that is not what we are talking about here, and I'm going to take all of this off. In the old system, Akasha is called sacred Akasha, divine, because everything is within it. And the first element is and every element that 
we see in our universe come from these. So, we are talking about Plato's and Aristotle's incorporeal principles attached to the four great divisions of the universe. This is present. What is the fifth that is going to come at the end of our round into the air? In the Secret Doctrine, we are told the astral light is going to become visible in the air. So, from Akasha then, astral. This is the fifth. It's not visible yet, but it will become visible. <laughs> The potencies, forces, hierarchies are all graduated. They are in sevens always, because seven, she tells us, is the factor number for our man mantra. Seven is the factor number. And as we saw from the beginning, the forces are intelligent. There is intelligence in our universe, and there is law. What is that law called? Karma. There is law, and the whole of that law comes under karma. This is universal law. It's not man-made. It's not human made at all. It is the law of the universe because the causation of the universe contained within that egg brings it about and what does it work on? Harmony. It's the vibration that the star sees and everything in our universe pulsates to that heart. The kernel, mother kernel, in the center of the universe. Now let's look at this for instance for a minute. We can see that the solar system, all of these globes, all function together. They all are harmonious with one another. And there is the sun in its center, and they revolve around the sun. So the sun is the center star of our universe, the solar system. But the solar system is a point when you look at our uh, Milky Way galaxy, it's just one little dot, and we only know Earth. How much of the Earth have we seen? How much of it do we know? So you have to, in your imagination, start from that center point and circle it around and open it. This helps open our consciousness to grapple with these ideas because what are we? A ray from that universal soul that we talked about. The universal soul, Alaya, is present. Uh, in the secret doctrine, it's described as the surface of the circle. But she says the center is also at the periphery. What do, you bo what do we call that? Circumference. The center is expressed in the circumference and the circumference is expressed in the center because you can draw a line and you join the two together. So this is meta-mathematics, <laughs> but it is necessary to divulge a little bit outward to enlarge our own consciousness. So here's the law, harmony. According to Plato and Newton, this harmony is expressed in music the, the solar system as it goes through the akasha makes noise and that noise is the music of the spheres our ears cannot hear it because the sound is so large we are not able to perceive it the ear can only intone itself to certain range of sound it cannot hear it so harmony then is the law. What else is the law? Unity. We come from 
one single germ, one point. Unity. And we are told that the concern is for all, because Alaya represents the all. It's the universal oversoul, and we are away from it. So its concern is for all. So the strict justice then rules our world, which is not human made. It's just within that uh, germ all this is contained. And since we are away from that, we also in germ contain all of that. And now let's see what else was in here. Now there is a lot of metaphysics um, involved, but I don't think I'm going to go any further than that. In the secret doctrine, the four Maharajas are mentioned, uh, the Dharan Chohans are mentioned. Uh, it's a lot to absorb in one day. So we'll just leave that there and now turn it on to ourselves each living center we said is the laya or balancing point but we also are centers ourselves each one of us then has an internal and an external appearance and those who are familiar with the constitution of man and let us say what we just have put it up there this is the triad and this too was the four kernels. This is our constitution. This part is eternal. It is that ray called Supratma. And I'm giving you these terms so that you don't get confused when you read it in the secret doctrine. She refers to it with a lot of different terms. Supratma is one of them. It's eternal. This part, only the body is visible, but there's four constituent parts to the cube. Body is the one, physical body is the one that is visible. All the other three are not. What, what's the rest of it? The astral body, astral body, and then comes Jiva, which is the life principle that gives it energy and what's the next? Passions and desires. Desires. And what is that called? Tama. In the secret doctrine that's Tama. This is Linga Sarira, Jiva or Prana, and this is Kama. Okay. Just like the sun with the satellite uh, is uh, going around and um, doing its thing. The four uh, angles of our universe, they're imaginary points, but nevertheless they do exist because the great kings, the Maharajas, are at those points. So we do have protectors. It's necessary to understand that we are not these um, little sinful souls that the religions make out humanity to be but we are great human beings in evolution toward godhood this is what the secret doctrine's message is that we are gods in the making but at the at this moment we are just clumsy clumsy apprentices because we really do not know how to completely give ourselves to this path of development that we talk, uh, we heard this morning. The I doctrine versus the heart doctrine. The secret doctrine explains the heart doctrine, where the heart has to open up, become purified, and just like the sun, give light and energy to all those around. As a human being, this is our responsibility to open up and um, be evolve to this. Um, greatness that uh, we bring into uh, the universe. So, and how do we do that? 
how do we align ourselves to this uh, inner life that um, is um, our real self, the higher uh, expression of ourselves? Well, uh, the paramitas, the perfections that were ex uh, mentioned in the uh, voice, the six paramitas, um, we all know that. Um, the first one, love and kindness and charity to all those that we come in contact with because we are interconnected to everything. The second one is harmony, the third one is patience and so forth. All those work together and they're in the voice of the silence. Now this one here um, brought a new point to the forefront and it is this. Divine wisdom, the wisdom of the ages, is also equivalent to truth. Because it is stated on all of these writings, there is no higher religion than truth. So, truth is necessary in us as well. <laughs> this is the master's philosophy. They gave it out, and we are to learn it, put it in, in other words. But that is the first step, putting it in is the first step. What happens is that it, gels, it gets distilled. Who am I? I'm a soul. I'm a soul. I'm not a body. I'm a soul. The soul then synthesizes what is being put in, and what comes out of me is the distillation of that information. That's the only way it becomes knowledge. There's a difference between information and knowledge. Knowledge shows us in what direction to go. So, truth then is necessary, it, it states in this article, for the awakening, progressive awakening of the soul to its inner life. Truth. What is truth? Is it relative truth or absolute truth we are talking about? The soul looks at things directly. It knows its integrity is absolute. But the personality, my name and form, has to align itself with that inner truth. The soul, in other words. The alaya, the soul. And that align, align man then takes away criticism from that person because where is the search line turned in towards on me I'm turning that search line on myself why I need to know what the change I need to bring about what is necessary for me to abide with absolute truth in our words the soul will show us through that search light how can I, um, for instance, there's a simile. Uh, let us consider the me to be the glass. If I'm colored, scratched, damaged, out of focus, then I won't be able to see exactly what the soul is showing me. But in order to see, this purification process has to go on. So the searchlight is turned on me, and I'm looking at myself as to, what change I need to bring about. In other words, what faults do I have? Because the inner life will show it to you. And through this process then, we become able to, to walk on that path. We're going, we're going to walk this path. And truth is the only thing that removes the faults. What else does it remove? Fear. Truth removes fear. If that searchlight is turned on me and I'm able to look at it directly and it shows me what it is, if I have any courage, I'll stand up to it. I'll look at it and see what it is being shown. That does not make me courageous though. To follow with action that comes from visualizing that truth about my fault requires courage. That is why 
it is said that courage is necessary. Courage, conviction, is necessary. Conviction that what has been given is the truth, as much of it as it was given and as best as it could be put on paper. And that distillation process of that information that I'm putting in, that is what knowledge is. It becomes knowledge in me because I'm distilling it. The soul is synthesizing it and it is distilling it. And that is what is knowledge. Knowledge is not something that we're going to get during meditation or in sleep. Those moments might come and it might give a lesson. But the lessons that are needed to be learned is in our daily lives. Our daily events come as the reflection of my life in the other spheres that I live as a soul. What is here is a reflection of it. What is it that I need to do from the perspective of the higher life? And if I can see that, it only comes with the truth I have become truthful and as a child this student always wondered why Muhammad was called Al-Amin means he could not lie and he could not cheat and to this student why was that so very important now this student understands why it is so very important because habitual truthfulness has to be there that we cannot just go according to societal norm as to what truth is because that's only relative truth but the absolute truth that my soul indicates to me from my inner life enables me to become habitually truthful in other words I also become Al Amin I can no longer lie and I cannot cheat it is my nature that has transformed itself to that condition and it is necessary on this path so it says it is symbolized and realized by a series of progressive awakenings accessions of honesty which are the milestone on the road, road to honesty the first rift in our self picture cracked by some event that upsets us is the primary awakening of the series Others follow, for nobody can stand still. And the great awakening is the sum of them all, the consummation. So these progressive awakenings are steps on that road, but the consummation always comes as well. It will inevitably arrive for the honest student. The first drift passed, he will have light enough to make and surmount others. And the eternal fearless eternal is in us all everyone we are that we are alaya we are part of that oversoul and we have all those powers that we <coughs> connected to the germ in its center in us and now we will open it for questions In the Christian Bible, it talks about the Christian God doing all that in seven days. And you did mention seven being the factor for this man, Vantron. Mm -hmm. So, um, a man is sevenfold. Right. The, 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 the process that you spoke of from the beginning of the egg being cracked down to, I was just trying to figure um, the formation, you know, uh, Metaphysical to physical. Yes, and, and, and I guess this is just a quasi-question, but a comment in a way. But okay. I was just trying to relate this, you know, in the Christian Bible, on the first day, it says, well, let there be light. And from that light, the condensation on down to material matter. Mm -hmm. So, and then those elements, you said, fire, earth, no, fire, air, water, earth, mm -hmm. and how they Flowed or follow that pattern, that same pattern, in, in within the seven periods. Mm -hmm. So I was I was just yes. going up to seven. But Akasha is the first one. Yes. And sometimes it does have an H here. I've seen it both. Akasha is that 
ethereal primordial substance. This is metaphysical. Okay? At this stage, we're at the beginning of that process, and we always designate it this way. It was in Pralaya this way, and as soon as she puts that in there, we're in the active period. Now, what is one day of Brahma, though, is what we really need to discuss here, because uh, Mr. Judge gives it at the end of the ocean, uh, I just look at him, and she has, he has a list where, um, what page is that? It's marked on mine, but it's not marked on this one. It's at the, towards the end here, because it's on page 125. And he gives chronologically um, all of the ages. And she, he says that Kali Yuga itself is 432,000 years. We are in Kali Yuga. And when you go further out from Kali Yuga, uh, the Bronze Age was 864,000 years, which is double ours. And if we add another 432 to that, we come up with 1,296,000 years for the uh, silver, and then 1,728,000 for golden. And a student that was sitting over there had given a talk where she had told us in the golden age, we live 400 years. In the silver, 300. In the bronze, 200 and Kali Yuga approximates about 100 Earth years for our lives. So the first period, even though gold and silver, excuse me, um, there is no uh, ugliness around us, we obviously learn slower because we're virgin souls coming into substance, right? Virgin souls coming in, and we're going to gain experience, learn, and then um, this uh, six and this part is coming down into matter, and this part is going to be going back to a spirit. We are a spirit, but virgin. We have no experience. We're going to gain it and then turn around and go back up. This is millions of years we are talking about. Um, because the secret doctrine tells us we are the fifth sub race of the fifth root, and the fifth root has been on earth for one million and over, some years over than one million years. So we're talking about immense period of life and car incarnation too. How are we going to be perfected to go up towards a spirit? But we have already achieved it. We are the fifth sub-race or fifth root. We have passed the fourth. We are now in the, um, we have passed this in the generation towards that way. So as the student said, we don't have to remain in Kali Yuga. By this effort that we talked about, we can bring the golden age back to our earth and influence all those around us to move in that direction. Because uh, after this point, which we have passed the middle of the um, fourth round, um, it's a self-induced, self-devised effort. Because we are intelligent human beings, we are self-encouraged. Um, um, self, um, In other words, we make these decisions for ourselves. Other people are not forcing it on us. Um, so self-development requires that input into it, but from the um, correct perception. And we said this was one of the scandals the student had mentioned the other day. Correct perception is necessary. If we look at ourselves as a body, our perception will be different than when we look at ourselves as souls because I'm identifying myself with my body. I'm not my body. I need a body for earth existence, but I'm not my body. I'm the soul. So from your point, 
and the primordial substance is inclusive of all of the elements. And just like um, the shell of an egg that breaks and brings the chicken out, our <laughs> Brahma's egg, which is our universe, also brings about every form in it. Uh, this student did not go into the Maharajas and the um, Baranchohanic hierarchies as to how that process comes about because it requires a talk on its own. It's too large uh, for one talk. But nevertheless, Akasha is inclusive of all of the archetypal forms. Whether it is expressed or unexpressed, it nevertheless is there. But it is the Maharajas that bring that um, plastic mind into activity by giving the atoms a propulsion. And she tells us they are um, psycho-spiritual. The atoms are not physical, they are psycho-spiritual. Mm -hmm. So from this Akasha then, all of the other elements. But ours actually dwarfs that uh, chemical list we have, dwarfs the elements into that condition because it does our science does not recognize that these elements also are souls as a follow as a follow up uh could you what then is a liar is a liar akasha uh as i believe uh yeah the first speaker stated about wh what man little little avails of man how it was put it it's it's the oversoul it's the oversoul and so what's it, okay, you're saying and it uh, is the oversoul. You say the sources of this uh, universe and its primordial aspect, she explains it in the Secret Doctrine on page, the Secret Doctrine 1 on 289 to 293, she explains to us what that is. She says, in this condition at the beginning, <coughs> this is a, a spiritual fluid that covers the surface of the universe. <coughs> <coughs> she calls it divine akasha. Remember there is seven gradations to this. So we are talking about alaya, over soul, its soul aspect in its seventh, the highest gradation. And she calls that a spiritual fluid. Spiritual fluid. And it, it is everywhere and it's not absent from any spot anywhere. So it is omnipresent, correct? And that's what she's talking about. Does that help? Okay. And each human soul then is a ray from a planetary soul. The Diani, Diani Chohan are our spiritual progenitors, but uh, this student did not go into any of that today on purpose. It's way too large for one talk. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, the idea that Prabraham and um, well, Prakriti is spirit and primordial substance is when synthesized create Prakriti mm. or when combined when combined spirit. brings about life okay Okay. because a spirit without a form or substance to present itself is not there as far as we're concerned because we can't see it but substance without the fecundating principle of a spirit is not active, it's just dormant, it's there. But the spirit is necessary to make that activity come about. And for that reason, there are all those creative hierarchies in the universe that actually bring about that uh, process. Does that help? But, what are you, but then again, um, you talked about spirit and matter. So <laughs> in this world, would you say that the human is the highest level of combination of that? On Earth. On Earth. Yeah. I'm sorry. Purusha is the um, term that she
the Holy Spirit in the secret places of the differentiation. Dusha. Because Parabram and Mulakrakriti are undifferentiated. Undifferentiated. After differentiation, it becomes Purusha and Prakriti. Okay? Sorry, I left that one out. I think I, I skipped over it. I'm sorry, say that again. So, on this earth, mm -hmm. what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that humans are, if you will, the highest level of this combination of spirit and matter. In other words, we are here from a Christian point of view. We are gods in the making, but also representatives of gods in the physical form to influence the process going from where we are now in Kali Yuga to the Golden Age. In other words, we can make a difference in the, in the length of time it takes from, go, from going from one to the other, or actually, you know, turn, turn our world into a Golden Age during this age of Kali Yuga. Okay. We're self-conscious individuals, right. each one of us. And this is what I think Maya is, that we are all individuals and we look at ourselves and consider ourselves to be separate from one another. But when we become perceptive on the inner lines of our being and we can see that light, because the light in each human being is alaya, is a ray of that uh, over soul. So light is the soul in us. And when this light then puts the searchlight on your holes or the defects, it is showing you how to improve that aspect of your life. Okay? This is not imaginary. It isn't imaginary. Let me see. Okay. Uh, here HPV tells us man epitomizing all is composed of all the great elements and the recorders are the Maharajas, uh, the Lipikas, okay? The stand before them stand the seven primordial beings. Who are them? <coughs> Who are the seven primordial beings? The primitive ones, okay? The primitive ones are the ones that enable the universe to evolve out of themselves, okay? So this is metaphysical, but nevertheless we can apply it to ourselves. And to answer your question, um, <coughs> <coughs> the soul of the world, Alaya, is the all. We are all in it. From God to man, from world to atoms, from a star to a rushlight, from the sun to the vital heat of the meanest organic being, the world of form and existence is an immense chain whose links are all connected. And this is the bit that we don't really realize because we're all busy living our own lives. We forget that we're truly interconnected because this light comes from the same source. The S, it comes from a us. It's not two. It isn't three. It is one. One becomes three, which is the triad, right? That's how we have to connect it in our heads to help us a little bit understand it. But in its origin, it's one. It's one because it is in the center, but it is also in the periphery. The S is everywhere. It's connected. It's interconnected. And you can look at us as rays from this single source. Each one of those lines then becomes this light that's in my own inner heart. And as we go along the line, <coughs> we can perceive it. 
So if there is this interconnectedness uh, for to answer your question, on Earth it is stated human mind is the propulsion power. But that mind is the divine mind we're talking about. The intellectual mind then has to reflect the <coughs> higher aspect of it. The divine mind is in each one of us, but we have to learn to bring it into use by following the searchlight that comes from the light and it shows you as to how you're going to repair or plug the hole in you in order for that light to shine. Yes? Uh, it just struck me in this moment that, that your drawing was a, a representation of light, but that uh, it looks uh, very much like the eye, which is a receptacle for light on, and on the physical plane. Uh, and just as a thought experiment, where else could that geometrical or representation be applied? Thank you. That is a very poignant statement because she says the eye is the window of the soul. Not only it exudes light because we synthesize light in ourselves, but it also receives light. It's a two-way lens, in other words. If she says if we didn't synthesize white light, we could never ever be able to perceive it on the outside. Yes. Yes. No, I'll do. I think. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned how I guess all human souls are individual souls within the great soul. But what I what's the relationship potentially with sort of angelic beings with the great soul? The angelic beings are at the East, West, North, South. The evangelic beings are put by Fohat as a wheel in those spots wherever it is. It's imaginary. Remember, it's imaginary. And those evangelic beings are angels of the Christian religion. And she calls them the Maharajas in the secret doctrine. Their purpose is to protect because magnetically she says we create causes humanity creates causes and as a result the punishment comes because the cause is going to have its effect where is the effect going to go to the ones who brought it into uh, our present state in the first place how are we rela related to those these beings Chohan, okay. These are the archangels of the Christian religion in the secret doctrine. She says, Diane Chohans are our spiritual progenitors, and the Maharajas who sit in those corners are the king Diane Chohans, the kings of the Diane Chohans. These are our spiritual progenitors, okay? Uh, there are hierarchies of them. I didn't go into hierarchy. And um, the four higher ones she does not talk about, she only talks about the three lower ones of these hierarchies. And she says, our mind was lighted up by Kumaras, Makara is also related to that. Who are they? Makaras or Kumaras? They're the spiritual entities who reside in the constellation Capricornus. She says our history is written in the zodiacal sign, not on earth. Who else? These beings lighted our light. They made us self-conscious beings. Pitar fathers? gave us their Sarya. Sarya. What is that? 
the ethereal form that this body is built upon is a gift from the Pitar fathers. So all these beings are the angels and archangels that you inquired about that have a connection to us because we come from them, every one of us. We are not simple little human beings. We come from tremendously intelligent spiritual entities. We just haven't learned to express it. Zipri, you had a question? It was just uh, or a comment. I, well, I was noticing, you know, like a liar, and yes. you know how they say liar, liar points. Yes. And then the A itself, like Abraham and Auntie Brahman, and then they put an A in front of it. So the, uh, a li like I said, that was just something I was just thinking about. Um, a liar, uh, in, in the light, right? The liar point is the hole where the light comes through. And then it's an equilibrium point mm -hmm. because that uh, equilibrium point has an external and an internal aspect to it, just like mm -hmm. we are. Mm -hmm. We have an internal aspect to ourselves as well as an uh, external body. Mm -hmm. But in that sense, when it is primordial, it's darkness because the light has not uh, come out of it. And she actually expresses it in a very poignant way, Dupree, in this here, and I'm not able to repeat it. Just a minute, I'll read it to you. Here it is. In the Hindu pantheism, the four angels, the Maharajas that we're talking about, stand each on a lotus. The latter represented as growing out of Vishnu's navel, Vishnu being the protective powers. This is undoubtedly the most graphic allegory ever made, the universe evolving from the central sun, the point, the ever-concealed germ. For as soon as darkness, or rather that which is darkness for ignorance, has disappeared, in its own realm of eternal light, leaving behind only its divine manifested ideation, the creative logi, or the builders, the Dayan Chohans, have their understanding opened, and they see in the ideal world, hitherto concealed in the divine thought, the archetypal forms of all, and proceed to copy and build or fashion upon these models forms evanescent and transcendent because these are the first <coughs> um, fashioners. The central sun is deity, the world soul. It is Sat, Saros, <coughs> and the Babylonian god whose circular horizon was a visible symbol of the invisible, zero ana. It is the chakra of Vishnu having its circumference everywhere because it is boundless. It has therefore its central point also everywhere, including us. In other words, in every point of the universe. The one, the original, can had no existence in the sense applied to it <coughs> by mortal man. We, we concretize it. It is not concrete. The honor one, the honored one, dwells in the center as it does in the circumference, as you pointed out. So the light or its absence is darkness, but it's there. But as soon as the ignorance of the darkness is removed, it's the same with us. As soon as it is removed, our eye then can look directly at things and perceive them for what they are. Thank you. Just uh, you, you were talking about the Diana Chohans. Uh, I was reading that um, we're basically, if, if I understand it correctly, Diana Chohans in training, and that we, uh, if we choose the what the correct path, are basically here learning to elevate ourselves in the uh, hierarchy. We come from Diana Chohans. We go through this uh, worldly experience. And then we circle back up or something like that. It says in the voice of the silence that the 
Mahatmas have become the sons of Dharan Chohan. So when you become one with the all, you reflect that, that life that is uh, them. Because we are them. We're connected. So. Okay, yeah. we're going to take a short break and then uh, start our afternoon session uh, studying the Ocean of Theosophy. Thank you. Join us next week at 11 o'clock. Okay, I brought some food, so you can snack on it a little bit.